when looking at the superficial veins, we talk about the great saphenous and the small saphenous veins, and I bring that up because we've had a terminology problem uh, over, the, over the years, but there's been an international consensus conference that hopefully has solved that problem. In the United States, previously, we had a greater saphenous and a lesser saphenous vein, the lesser saphenous being the one along the posterior calf in the superficial system. In the United Kingdom, for example, they had a long saphenous vein, which is what we call the greater saphenous vein, and they had a short saphenous vein, which we call the lesser saphenous vein. You can see the problem. In the United States, we used LSV to re refer to lesser saphenous vein. In the United Kingdom, they used LSV to refer to long saphenous vein, and we could never communicate properly with one another. So the International Consensus Conference decided we will now use the terminology of a great saphenous vein along the medial thigh and calf, and a small saphenous vein along the posterior calf, abbreviated GSV and SSV. The, the acronym LSV should no longer exist, and it is no longer used when we're properly discussing the superficial venous system. So, in the superficial veins, we have a great saphenous vein coming off approximately mid-common femoral vein, running along the medial thigh and the medial calf down to the level of the ankle, and along the posterior calf, typically emanating from or emptying into the popliteal vein, somewhere in the popliteal space, a small saphenous vein. And that's the anatomy that we are dealing with at this point. The other thing to remember about the saphenous venous systems is they are contained within a fascial sheath. There is a fascial plane close to the probe near the skin, a superficial and a deep fascial plane. The saphenous system, in this case the great saphenous vein, is contained within that fascial sheath. If you see a superficial vein, such as this small one out here, Outside of that fascial sheath, it is no longer the great saphenous vein properly. It is a branch of the great saphenous vein. And it is very important to identify specifically, particularly in cases of primary varicose veins when they're going to be treated, are we dealing with a varicose branch or are we dealing with the great saphenous vein itself? So we need to pay particular attention to the presence or absence of this fascial sheath that will surround the true saphenous vein and the absence of this when we're dealing with branch vessels. Likewise, the same applies to the small saphenous vein along the posterior calf. You see the near and far fascial planes. Distinguished from intramuscular branches, the gastrocnemius veins, which also empty directly into the popliteal vein, but they remain within the muscular compartment. The small saphenous vein very quickly becomes a superficial vein, again constrained by that fascial sheath. Here, we are interested in not only obstruction and valvular competence or incompetence, but the presence of these varicosities and associated branches as they can contribute to significant venous insufficiency. This also brings up the concept and the importance of the calf muscle pump. When the calf muscles contract, and for example, as when we take a step, the muscles bulge, they will put extrinsic pressure on the venous system and cause emptying. It's basically an inherent augmentation maneuver and increase flow back towards the heart. When the calf muscle relaxes and the extrinsic pressure on the veins is removed, normally the valves in the veins will prevent reflux flow from occurring down into the calf and you'll have then refilling of these veins which when the calf muscle contracts again will cause augmented flow back towards the heart in a nice rhythmic fashion when a patient is ambulating. What this means in terms of pressures is pressure relief on the deep veins in the lower leg particularly. We will see with a calf muscle contraction we will have augmented flow into the deep venous system back towards the heart and with competent valves there can be no reflux flow. So with in a matter of taking just a few short steps, one can reduce pressures in the venous system at the ankle from as much as 100 millimeters mercury to less than 20 millimeters mercury without any difficulty whatsoever. And this large drop in so-called ambulatory venous pressure, abbreviated AVP here, will restore basically normal pressures or pressures within the venous system that it can easily tolerate and withstand. So the calf muscle pump is a very important functional system that allows us to prevent ambulatory venous hypertension. 
So think of walking as a good thing and the exercise in the face of a normal calf muscle pump will enhance venous emptying and inhibit the chronic ambulatory venous hypertension that sometimes can develop. When we have primary varicose veins, this all changes now. The calf muscle pump may still work, but we may have these superficial veins that become very tortuous and look like small ropes underneath the skin with flow going in all possible directions, obviously. Or in this three-dimensional representation, you can see the tortuous path that these varicose veins ultimately do take. And when you look at a patient's leg, you see the same thing as they are directly under the skin. The problem with primary varicose veins is when we ambulate, the calf muscle pump can still do its job emptying into the deep system, but the superficial venous insufficiency allows reflux flows to come right back down and through our perforating veins very quickly refill the calf compartment. That means as we're ambulating, instead of an 80% decrease in ambulatory venous pressure, in the presence of primary varicose veins, we may only decrease our venous ankle pressure from 100, millime 100 millimeters mercury to 50 millimeters mercury or so. This is an elevation in pressure that will keep the veins dilated. Eventually, there may be some breakdown and development of chronic edema and some tissue changes and ultimately possibly ulceration at the level of the ankle in these patients, simply because we cannot, when we're ambulating, decrease our venous pressure enough to prevent those chronic changes from occurring. What we look at with duplex ultrasound is evidence of normal resting flow in a saphenous vein, but now when we compress proximally above the vein, we are able to force reflux flow back down into the calf past incompetent valvular sites when we release that proximal compression, we then get augmented flow, but again, we see the reflux flow recurring very quickly. So we have evidence by duplex ultrasound of systemic valvular incompetence in the great saphenous system in this particular case, which will then lead to that ambulatory venous hypertension and the changes associated with chronic venous insufficiency. The same applies to any branches we might see off the saphenous vein. This is a large varicose branch coming over the anterolateral aspect of the left thigh. And again, you can see with proximal compression above the site of Doppler interrogation, that sustained reflux flow for as long as you're willing to use that augmentation maneuver and inducing reflux flow in that vein, again, indicating the incompetence in that particular large varicosity. In this case, a branch vein off the great saphenous, not the great saphenous vein itself.